Today on Talkback, is tuition necessary? How can employers be convinced to give ITE and poly graduates a fair shot when it comes to career advancement? And moving to politics, what is constructive politics and how can we make it happen here in Singapore? We're talking today with Senior Minister of State for Education and Law, Indrani Raja. Now, in the aftermath of the 2011 general election, she left her job as a high-flying lawyer for full-time office, in spite of the fact that she acknowledged it was not an easy time then to be a politician. We're going to be talking about this and a wide range of issues today, not just politics, but education as well, something she's been deeply involved in. Call us with your questions for Miss Indrani Raja on 669-11938. Of course, you can also talk to us on Facebook, Official 938 Live. Thank you for coming in, ma'am. Hi. A very good morning. Now, Indrani, you're a member of the uh, Skills Future Council. I want to talk about things that have happened recently and recent developments in your career. Uh, The Skills Future Council, of course, is taking forward key recommendations under both the Applied Study in Polytechnics and ITE Review, of course, the Aspire Committee, and the Continuing Education and Training Master Plan uh, 2020. Now, you headed the Aspire Committee, and Skills Future is a new initiative. Uh, Tell us more about how it's been going so far. Okay, first thing I should... Uh, explain is that as the Aspire recommendations have to be implemented and the implementation is being overseen by Skills Future. So there's actually a sort of link between Aspire and Skills Future just in case people hadn't made that connection. Right. But Skills Future is for all Singaporeans, I understand. Yes. Not just poly ITE graduates. Yes, it is. Mm. The w- When the report was being worked on, it looked specifically at the poly and ITE, but we very soon realized that this is something that you know touches everyone uh, across the board. And so Skills Future work really is about a national movement. It's a national movement that concentrates on the progress of Singaporeans, opportunities for Singaporeans. The idea is that it doesn't matter where you start. It should be important that you have a chance to progress at any point of your life, that learning is lifelong, you've got to have progression pathways, and it's really about a future that's dependent on skills. What challenges do you envisage arising in the future in terms of making this initiative a long-term success? Maybe you could talk to us about some indicators of success. What would they be for you? I think one big indicator of success is that when people realize that skills is a combination of your knowledge, the application and experience. In other words, there should not be an excessive paper chase. It's not just the qualification per se. It's what you can do with the knowledge you have. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is realizing that it's lifelong because your jobs will change. The way you do the same job will change and some jobs may be swept away. So you're going to have to learn new skills in the same job or sometimes you're just going to have to learn a completely new and different job. And the other part of it is also getting employers on board to create um, what we call progression pathways, but that just basically means for people to be able to, to progress in your job, learn new skills, advance. I'm glad you brought up the employers part of it because employability is a big part of your, if you want a future in Singapore and pathways. Uh, but mindset, is it, has it been difficult to change getting employers on board, you know, especially when it comes to giving ITE students and polytechnic students a shot uh, at the apple, perhaps? You're right about the need for mindset change. And that's something that has to be done across the board. Teachers, parents, students and the employers. Employers, actually, when you speak to them, will tell you they really like having ITE and poly students because they're work ready. They, they have the skills. Um, but all employers also look at, you know, the organization, the, the bottom line. Once you have somebody in, not all employers are progressive in the sense of looking to see how you can develop somebody. You're happy when you have sure. somebody in a particular position. Right. But after that, where does the person go? But if you're an employee, you're like, OK, I've done three, four years of this. I want to be able to progress. Right. So it's it's getting um, all employers on board to have, you know, h- progressive HR practices and thinking in a way that is beneficial to both employer and employee. Is what it- challenges do you foresee in that arena, though? Because... Clearly, mindset change is always difficult to effect in any context. Yeah, you're quite right. It, it only works if both sides see a benefit to it. Let, let's give a very simple example of a challenge. You've got an employee who wants to upgrade, learn something. That means go for a course. 
the employer has to be willing to give time off. So if, if let's say, you know, working hours end at 6.30, uh, let the guy go and do his studies because he may not be able to, to stay over time. Supportive employers, there's some employers who will also uh, pay for the, the the studies, give scholarships, etc. This kind of thing makes a big difference. Is what it about- the SME part of it that is more of a problem in that mindset change? I wouldn't sort of pigeonhole uh, categories of companies, but I have a lot of sympathy for SMEs because they have, you know, they have tight cost constraints. Indeed. They have manpower constraints. But Spring is working quite hard with, uh, you know, on the, on their schemes to see how they can support SMEs to do this. One of them is the Talent Plus scheme. So I'd encourage, you know, SMEs to go speak with Spring, check out their website because there are a number of initiatives here. What about the notion of going beyond an academic meritocracy? Some of our listeners have expressed that for too long now, we've been so focused on academic meritocracy that it's become so difficult to look at a person's other skills and other capabilities. Indeed, and that's what MOE has been working on for the past couple of years, trying to make people understand that it's not all just about the grades. The the problem with this, though, (laughs) is that it people often see it as a binary conversation. So when you, when you say don't have excessive focus on grades, what people sometimes hear is grades are not important anymore. And I've had, oh, okay. I've had reports of people coming to tell me, oh, you know, um, my, my child told me that, mommy, I don't have to study anymore <laughs> because <laughs> grades are not important. Well, we have selective hearing on our program uh, here as well. <laughs> yes, indeed, we do. In a big way. Uh, but I don't hold it against people. This is right. how people receive messages. Right. So what do you think needs to be done in order to take this dialogue further and to actually get people thinking about what's important to them in their lives, in their children's lives, instead of constantly saying that, oh, no, 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 the education system demands it of us, because for so many years, the education did demand it of them. Now that the education system is changing, uh, there are different messages coming from the ministry. How can people actually get on board faster, more quickly? I think the essential thing is to understand what is education about. Education is to prepare you for life. And real life, as we know, is not just about the academic knowledge. When you work with people, would you rather work with someone who's really smart but has a terrible personality or perhaps, you know, hasn't got straight A's, uh, B's and a mixture of some A's, but is a much nicer team player to work with? Obviously, the second one. Or would you work with somebody who's smart but dishonest? So real life is a combination of things. Can I just su- summarize it in three uh, points, which, is, which are MOE's key thrusts? One is the academic portion, important to have that foundation. Two, CCE, character, citizenship, education, values, right? And the third one is what we call the 21st century competencies, which is a big word for common sense things that we know like communication skills, teamwork, problem solving, all of those things. It's, it's a holistic approach. You've said before that not every pursuit of uh, your studies needs to be centered on utilitarian things like employability, so on and so forth. It's also got to be about broadening your horizons. For instance, why would you watch a play or read a book? It's about broadening your horizons. Yes. So I'm just wondering if our listeners see value in that as they bring up their children. We're joined now by Felicia on 669-11938. Hi, Felicia. Hi, good morning, um, Bharati, uh, Keith, and uh, MP in Hi. Uh, hi. I like to ask because I think the starting point, the starting point for a child, is so important and it's causing so much stress now. And parents are sending their children to various different kindergarten or nursery uh, based on their social economy. And uh, what can school do to narrow the social inequality, such as forming like exclusive circles? that we see now in, in different uh, types of kindergartens. Mm, let's discuss that for a moment. Ms. Indrani, this has been a point of contention for a lot of parents, that it is unequal starting points. And, of course, certain groups of people will always be at a disadvantage in spite of certain government programs to assist those in the lower-income group. Um, let's, the, the first point is, yes, certainly it's important for the children to start when they're young. Um, but the second point I would make is, when they're young like that, it should really be about exposure and just letting them get exposure to things. Please do not try to make your child accomplish the primary one syllabus before they're in primary one. Then there's a the question of 
how do, what are the access to opportunities for that yeah. and that's why we've introduced the anchor operator scheme which basically you know gives parents uh, access to uh, preschool and also introduce the subsidies for childcare as well as kindergarten and the idea is to make sure that everybody has access not everybody has to have you know exactly the same kind of preschool education but so long as you've got a good base a good foundation to s- prepare you for primary one i think that's fine we want to come back and talk some more about that uh, you are listening to talk back on 938 live we are speaking today with uh, senior minister of state for education and law indrani raja we're going for a recap of the top stories making the news this hour keep it right here on 938 live discussing a wide range of issues today from education to politics with indrani raja she's senior Minister of State for Education and Law. You can call in with your questions for Indrani Raja on 669-11938. Of course, you can also talk to us on Facebook, Official 938 Live. Felicia, who called in earlier, Ms. Indrani, talked about starting points for children when it comes to education. And Level I think that's, playing a, field. that's a concern among many, many parents right now because uh, the wealthier people can also afford more tuition and enrichment classes. You mentioned earlier that the Education Ministry is taking some initiatives to ensure that all kids get a healthy start with the anchor operators and also... And the MOE kindergartens as well. And the MOE kindergartens and subsidies for those things as well are available. And of course, don't forget, EduSafe subsidies, so on and so forth. But really, can whatever the MOE does for the people in the not-so-well-off socioeconomic groups ever match what the wealthy in Singapore can do for their own children? I think the question is whether, in fact, it should. I'm, I'm not sure that we should. Because what you want to do is ensure that our children have a good base at preschool, a good base of knowledge, good base of social skills, a good base in terms of their, you know, motor skills as well. As well. But you, you, they shouldn't be university graduates in preschool. At four or five. <laughs> at four or five. Yeah. They, they should be enjoying their learning. They should be curious, they should be active, they should be happy. And, you know, that there's a certain sort of baseline level for that. There's some parents who may want to push the children beyond that. I'm not so sure that going too far in that direction is, is, is very healthy. But what we want to ensure is that for the broad majority of Singaporeans, they have access to good foundations for preschool and that the children have a good start. You I am said, to- sorry. I am totally ahead. ignorant about primary ones, but this preschool situation, when people are sending their students or uh, their children to multiple play schools, I use the word play school uh, very loosely, uh, on a daily basis to prepare them for primary one. Is this necessary? And in primary one, do you need a kindergarten to education? I would not think it's necessary to sort of send your child to multiple uh, play schools just to acquire a certain kind of academic curriculum. There's a distinction to be made between parents who send their children um, to preschool because the parents are working and you need to have your child somewhere before you come back. But too much hot housing, um, sort of trying to overload your your child with, uh, you know, academic content, I think at that stage, not so necessary because ultimately at the end of the day, it is, you can't give a child all the answers in life ahead of time. But what you want is that creative mind, that cur- that curious mind, and the ability to find answers for themselves. Mm. So as long as your children are happy and um, you know enjoy learning, then I think that they've got a bright future ahead of them. Now, you've said before that our education system is run on the basis that tuition is actually not necessary. Yet some teachers have told parents it is. And parents often say teachers are overstretched. They may not be able to give their child an edge. Therefore, tuition is necessary because we've been conditioned to believe that academic meritocracy is it uh, in Singapore. That's what everyone should be striving for. Bearing this in mind and what's been said since you made that statement, do you still stand by your assertion that really tuition is not necessary? Actually, thank you for giving me a chance to clarify this. When I spoke about it in Parliament, my sentence, I, I had two sentences. The first sentence was the part that was reported and, of course, generated quite a lot of excitement. And the second part wasn't quite linked to the first part. I started off by saying that the system isn't designed such that tuition is necessary, meaning that our curriculum is not one where you can only ever pass it if you have tuition. 
Mm. The second part of my statement was that, having said that, there are children who do need assistance to level up. So really, I was making a distinction between a, a few things. The first is, there, there, are some, there, there are two categories. There are some children who, for whatever reason, don't have a strong foundation in their math, science, English, and they, they need help. So for that, they do need the assistance. You can call it tuition, you can call it levelling up, whatever you want, but they need some help. Why can't the schools provide this? I understand schools have learning and, and support. And the schools do. Learning the schools support do. They have learning support programmes and many of the teachers are unsung heroes in this respect. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that hasn't really been well highlighted and I think it's something we should. Then there's the second category where the children are already scoring something like 95, 96% sure. and you know that's still not good enough because it's mm. felt that you must score 100. 100. That's the category where I think it isn't necessary, um, although some parents may disagree because they feel that, you know, that additional mark may make a huge difference. And we're not sure that, well, we don't think that that's so healthy. So you you know we've made the announcement that, that we'll be doing away with the T-score. For and that's PSLE. For PSLE. And that's really to indicate or to signal that it shouldn't be chasing that last half point or one point. I mean, if a child is 90-something percent, that child's already excellent. And he will be getting to the school of its choice, of his choice. I can't say it, so I, I only have a dog. His or her That's right. But that's the thing, you know, I, I hear from parents who continue saying that the system demands it of you. So, to what extent do you think actually changing the way that PSLE is graded would really go far in terms of changing perceptions and parents' expectations of their children and children's own expectations of themselves and each other? Uh, The changing of the T-score is one step in many. The the, the issue really is this. The reason why there's such a, a chase for that is the assumption or the feeling that I need to get a particular score in order to get to a particular school. Why do I need to get to a particular school? Because it's only if my child gets into this school that my child will have a good opportunity in life and be able to progress further. We've been conditioned for so many years in this manner. That's the thing. I know know that. But MOE is changing that because that is kind of like assumes that there's only one path with a very narrow entrance. What we're trying to do is stretch it out and make sure that the entrance is is large. And that doesn't mean to say that everybody uh, goes to the same school. It means that there should be a whole broad range of schools, all of which can provide your child with a good education so that your child can go further. And you've got to remember, not every child is the same. Some are, are good, you know, academically, and even within that range, some are better at certain subjects than others. Some are better with their hands, some are very creative, and they're not mutually exclusive. So when Minister Heng says every school is a good school, it should also be understood that not every school is the same school. And our plan is for every school to have a certain strength, and you you as a child and a parent, pick out the one that's good and the best for your child and let your child flourish. And I that's think that's a problem. much misunderstood statement. Indeed. Every school is a good school because <laughs> uh, people, some people still deride it yes. and say, are you sure every school is a good school? Really? It, it makes sense if so long as you hear it together with not every school is the same, same school. school. Right. Second uh, part of the sentence. If yes. I don't get to this school, my child is... F- my child's future is obliterated. Mm, you'll find that that will not be the case. So perhaps parents too need to take some ownership here, decide for themselves what path they want to go on, uh, instead of always only taking the cue from the government. And actually, if you look at it in terms of actual outcomes, Singaporeans do well, uh, irrespective of sure. their backgrounds, when you ask them where they've come from. So I have a great deal of faith in our Singaporean students. Mm. Let's talk about the PSLE and uh, some suggestions that it should be scrapped. Now, it's been told to us that it will not be scrapped. However, those adjustments will be made in terms of the grading system, so on and so forth. However, you've been, you've, you are familiar with the Finnish system of education that has been lauded the world over. And they don't have a national exam for 12-year-olds. In fact, they do it a, a little bit later in a child's life, in an individual's life. Why can't we go that way? I think no matter what system you have, you can't run away from some form of assessment. And so you you do need to have something that gives you an objective benchmark. Under our current system, there's a question of which secondary school do you go to. Now, how do you choose uh, who gets to go where if you don't have a kind of 
benchmark, a benchmark or right. an objective system. Sure. So I, I think of PSLE a little bit like the Harry Potter sorting hat, you know, where, where who gets to go where. But that's but the thing that causes be, pressure. But it shouldn't be purely, uh, well, it, there shouldn't be an over-dependence on grades alone. So it comes back to what I said earlier, different types of schools, different strengths for different children. We'll continue talking about this in just a while on Talk Back. Stay with us on 938 Live. Also going to be talking all about constructive politics in our next segment. We've been talking with Senior Minister of State for Education and Law, Indrani Raja. Between, uh, I think, in our first segment, we obviously focused on education. Preschool and otherwise. Mm. Let's move on to politics. Now, first of all, Ms. Indrani, why did you enter politics? At which stage? Because I became MP 2001, right. then became a senior minister in, uh, of state in 2012. So which stage you Let's asking? talk about the MP stage first. First things first. Okay. Well, I, I guess when the, they asked about standards as a candidate, there were very few women MPs. And I felt that, you know, if you're, given, if you're being asked to, to step up, um, if, if I said no, all the other women asked said no. You wouldn't have very many women in Parliament. So I, f- I felt there was some room to make contribution. So that's why I said yes. What were some of your considerations, though, before saying yes? Um, my m- main consideration was whether I could contribute something positively. And at the I felt I could uh, because, you know, you, you when you're making policies, for example, um, it's helpful to have a different perspective. And I, I, I was one of the f- three single women MPs at that time. And I think it was a time when they recognized that there was a growing constituency of single women. So I felt that, mm. OK, you can bring a different perspective here. Let's talk about that. Singlehood. Single- I mean, <laughs> low marriage and fertility rates have been consistently making headlines in recent years. Mm-hmm. Why have you remained? single um not the not not the right person at the right time Mm. basically any regrets no i'm very happy what i'm doing um i've uh, said before that you know man proposes when god disposes Mm. so uh, god has not disposed we'll we'll see how that (laughs) are you still looking for someone (laughs) shut that (laughs) door off completely (laughs) i'll just take things as they come i've got loads on my plate now education law Mm. more than enough to keep me busy a lot has been uh, said in recent years about according singles more in terms of say housing benefits Mm. so on and so forth what are your views on that being a single woman yourself I think it's important to look at the concerns of singles and uh, in the context of housing, for example, you can see that the government has made a, a, a big change there and the recent policies on housing have introduced uh, flats for singles. And I think that it's good that the government's listening on that. Considering that more and more uh, people in Singapore might be single, certainly we're hoping not, but the way trends are going, there, will be, there might be more singles in Singapore in the future. Uh, what else do you think needs to be done in order to look after this particular constituency of people, even though uh, the government is as far as possible trying to promote marriage and parenthood? I think that one of the things you should look at is when they get older, because when you're young and able to do things for yourself and earning, that's fine. But I have quite a number in my constituency who are elderly, alone, and they don't have support uh, networks. So I think that growing, going forward as our population ages, that's going to be something that we have to look at very seriously. Will we be looking at single mothers? Uh, is there, you know, they don't get much maternity leave once they leave the is there going to be help for them there's a lot of concern that you know the single parents don't get as much as uh, the normal family unit housing right. grants and maternity yes. leave are the main things that have been cited Th- this is where we've got to maintain a balance um the question was posed to minister chan chun singh in Recent. parliament mm-hmm. uh, yes. the other day about you know what kinds of benefits are extended and he explained that actually there are quite a, a wide range of benefits that are extended to single mothers irrespective of sure. their uh, marital status but at the same time we're also trying to be careful not to send a signal to encourage um, women to have children out of wedlock. I know sometimes it's inevitable. It does happen. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you have a lot of sympathy for the mother and the child Mm -hmm. if they don't have family support. Um, From a policy perspective, though, you've got to be careful about how you calibrate it and what kind of signals you send. So in some countries which have been extremely liberal, they have found that as a result, um, the numbers of uh, children born out of wedlock have grown and those mothers really struggle. So you've got to make sure that people are 
can can meet you know their their needs uh, at the same time that you send the correct social message. Well, some people might say that you know just because you change policy to treat single mothers, for instance, more equally when it comes to say housing benefits, it doesn't mean that all these women are going to go out and have children out of wedlock. Uh, so explain to me why what has happened in other countries has happened where the number of single mothers has increased, and I think th- why that the, might happen here. In the UK, here. they do have an issue with this, where I think the benefit system is quite liberal and um they there have been quite a large number of uh, families which are, are you know single parent and it's been quite difficult for their system to cope for our side though for single mothers although the general policy is that the housing is not available we've encountered situations where they see us at the meet the people mm-hmm. sessions and we write in to HDB especially those who need rental flats for an exemption and uh, HDB looks at it on a case by case basis and for those who have really got no family support and no one else to turn to exceptions have been made um, but that's the exception rather than the norm mm, but maybe it should be the norm is what some people are saying because ultimately all this affects the welfare of the child as well that's true so it goes back to what i said earlier about having the right balance and making sure that those who really are in need are helped but at the same time not sending a message that you know in, encourages it beyond uh, a, a certain level now you yourself grew up in a single parent home and we'll talk about some of those challenges in just a while let's hear from Carla, Carla. first though hi, hi Carla go ahead good morning yeah, I hear what Miss Indrani Rani says that we shouldn't send a wrong signal and I also hear from Bharati that I think to be fair to the single parents Sometimes it's uh, not because of that law, but that could be a really a genuine reason as what we are addressing the issue that we need to look at case-to-case basis. And I think you need to hear out because I have a very close friend of mine who has a very genuine case why she has to be in that situation. But even for her to get a baby bonus when she rolled into some of the ministries, she was actually not entertained. And even they use such words as like, uh, it's an illegitimate child, like making the, pa- the, parents, the single parents feel very... Uh, disgusted in the sense that, you know, it's not right in the sense that I felt that everybody should be given a, a kind of empathy and look at them in a different light and doesn't mean even even is born in a wedlock. I think they should be given the due dignity of every individual soul that is here because I think the person who is affected in the long run is an innocent child and the parent being stig- stigmatized with this kind of labelling because this labelling came from one of the ministries who used the word that uh, the child is illegitimate. Mm. And the choice of words is used is even very, very painful when people are going through so much of challenges being being a single parent. Thank you oh, very thank much you for much. that, Carla. What do you think, uh, Miss Indrani? I mean, should policy also be taking a moral stand indirectly? I think you have to take a moral stand in many situations. But I also agree uh, that there is a there's definitely room for empathy. There's definitely room for understanding when a person's situation is difficult. So how the case is handled is just as important as what the policy is. And I also recognize that there are many women who may find themselves in this situation either through no fault of their own mm. or, you know, because of very unfortunate circumstances. Well, call us on 669-11938. Uh, tell us what you think of the various issues that we are discussing today with Miss Indrani Raja. Alex so, joining us now. Good morning, Alex. Hi, good morning. Go ahead, sir. Yes, uh, I, I belong to a creed, to the creed of Singaporeans, you know, where you know, I would like the PAP to ma- remain in power. But yet at the same time, you know, I would like to see some opposition in Parliament to ask questions and, you know, uh, be a check and balance. I'd like to ask Minister Indrani, you know, what her opinion is that, you know, in the event of a freak result one day, the opposition comes to the power, uh, what may happen to Singapore then? Thank you. Thanks very much for that question, Alex. Ms. Indrani? The answer depends really on what the opposition if they form a government, are able to do. Um, At the moment, uh, we really don't have an idea of that Mm -hmm. because there isn't a clear, consistent uh, set of policies put forward uh, by any of them. So, in in short, uh, it's really way out there because Mm -hmm. you don't know. You've mentioned in Parliament before that constructive politics needs to go beyond rhetoric and to achieve constructive politics, political parties will have to put Singaporeans first, offer practical alternatives that would ultimately result in better lives. Uh, They would also have to act responsibly by admitting the trade-offs of their policies instead of pandering to public opinion and saying what's popular. 
Now, cynics would say politics is inevitably rhetoric. How do you think your ideal vision of constructive politics can really be achieved here? I don't think that politics is in inevitably rhetoric, at least not in Singapore. That may be so in some other countries, but it isn't here, and I think we should keep it that way. And the reason I say that is because politics has a very real impact on people's lives. It affects their housing, it affects their education, it affects their health, it affects their children's future. So it should never be a game, and it should never be rhetoric. Um, your second question was really, you know, what what is the, the vision? Ideal I see. vision. Yes. Ideal vision. Ideal vision is when contesting uh, groups uh, in politics can come together and talk about something on which they disagree objectively, fairly, uh, factually, and ultimately with the best interests of Singaporeans at heart. On that note, we also want to talk, when you talked about that, what does social media thrown into the mix me <laughs> to you as well but we need to go for a short break keep it right here on 938 live you're listening to talk back i'm talking all about constructive politics and a wide range of other issues with indrani raja she's senior minister of state for education and law and we're taking your calls and comments for her on 6691938 now miss indrani we were talking about constructive politics earlier and your ideal vision of constructive politics you've accused the opposition of flip flopping when convenient, uh, such as in the case of the Workers' Party stance on foreign workers. You've also pointed out that they are quick to claim credit for policies such as MediShield Life and Call for More, but they are hesitant to offer their own detailed proposals. Uh, to what extent do you think Singaporeans are able to look beyond the desire for political diversity to properly examine the parties that claim to be able to lend that diversity to our political landscape? It also goes to what our last caller asked about political diversity, more questions being asked in Parliament, but there are questions about whether the opposition will be able to run the country. I think Singaporeans are discerning. The only thing is that everybody is busy. Everybody has a lot on their plate, a lot of work to do. So not everybody has time to sit down and really think through and examine the issues. So sometimes somebody has to do that and point that out. Uh, at other times, you hope that people, you know, actually examine things carefully and come to the right conclusions. By and large, Singaporeans are very rational. And by and large, they are discerning when they have to be. Um, but it really needs to, you need the set of circumstances when people's minds are focused and thinking about these issues. Throw into that mix uh, this phenomenon of social media. There are lots of divergent voices out there. Have you, are you affected personally by social media? <laughs> You're always aware of it, um, but I take that as par for the course. The, the Do you have to have a Teflon shell <laughs> for this sort of thing? You need, a, you need a certain imperviousness, but that imperviousness cannot be devoid of um, sensitivity to what people think and feel. So I think the starting place has to be, what do you believe? Where do you stand? And you've got to know where you are on that, and you've got to be able to say, say what you think, what you mean, and defend that position. Um, because it's impossible to go through life uh, without any sort of criticism or some kind of brickbats being thrown at you. Um, that said, I mean, social media is very much here to stay. Mm. Can't run away from that. So it's par for the course. To what extent do you think perhaps as Singaporeans, especially in our growing up years in school, for instance, uh, we need to have some sort of I wouldn't say another module on political awareness, but some kind of political education so that we can grow into a generation of Singaporeans who can actually debate policy intelligently, try to find out more about what's really going on in Singapore, what's behind certain policies, to be able to discuss it at a more nuanced level. I think what you're really talking about is um, rational uh, debate uh, without too much um, excessive emotion. I mean, it's ex exactly. effectively, that's what you're saying. I mean, just going online and telling someone you don't like them right. isn't good enough. I mean, you've yeah. got to back it up, say why, try and understand the other person's standpoint as well. And in, in this case, you know, what's behind the government policy, for instance. And actually, if you think about it, that's what we've tried to do, or have striven to do in our past 50 years as a nation. You will see that our debates in Parliament are very much about 
the issues. We, we try to make it that way. There are some other parliaments which are a lot more exciting, um, but perhaps, shall we say, less uh, debate on the substantive content. Um, at the same time, if you leech the emotion out of everything, right. uh, th- then you, you know pe- people just can't relate to it. So I think the important thing is your starting point must be a sense of courtesy and respect uh, and uh, respect that uh, other people have a different point of view. But it doesn't mean that you cannot you know, have a strong stance where you're coming from. As in many things, it's like yin and yang, you know, sure. there's, there's, a, there's a happy medium somewhere. Mm. Mm. The thing is, uh, a lot of people would say, yeah, no doubt you discuss things in Parliament, right. but it's not interesting enough for me to watch or read about. <laughs> it's more <laughs> although the on social media, felt. yes. It's although more the impact yes, is felt. So right. I think that's a decision they have to make. And maybe government needs to work on making some of their messaging more palatable as well. I, I think, yes, pe- people consume information now in sound bites, in bullet form in little capsules so that art of communicating the complex in a simple fashion is something that all of us are grappling with and government included. Now in the the aftermath of the uh, 2011 general election you left your job for full time office and you asked me earlier when I asked you why you entered politics what stage I was asking about. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this stage now. Uh, You said that it was not an easy time to be a politician. Why then did you decide to do it? Because it wasn't an easy time to be a politician. I think that there were challenges there. Um, PM asked if I would uh, be willing to join the team. And I thought about it and said, you know, this is something where it is challenging. It's difficult. Um, if if you don't step up to the plate uh, again when, the, when you're given the opportunity, um, you miss a chance in a lifetime of being able to make a difference. And that's the reason why I joined how do you separate work and play? Do you have time for play at all? <laughs> you know, you're here so early in the morning, you have work uh, after this, and after that, I'm sure you have constituency affairs to deal with. I think it could be even on a daily basis. How do you make time for yourself? Well, I've, I've learned to sort of divide the day up into little one hour or half hour slots. So, you know, where when I have an hour or something like that to take a time out, I, I do. But mostly I chill by reading. See how to get married. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not to worry, I'm sure there's some avid readers out there <laughs> who might, uh, you know, come forth and offer themselves up. Uh, you talked about your day. What keeps you awake at night? Um, read- reading through my emails, clearing my work, uh, reading newspapers. I, I do I check up on the newspaper reports uh, in in the morning as well as before I go to sleep at night just to make sure that, you know, Mm. I'm on top of things. What are the issues that you think about in in terms of what keeps you awake at night? I think trying to make sure that Singapore is safe, secure for the future. And I I don't mean just in terms of, you know, the, the normal security threat kind of thing, but making sure that we're a nation that has the right mindset, that we are equipped going forward and that we always have the sense of unity uh, and we see ourselves as, as, as a family, as a people, that we don't let go of values and that we have a, a strong uh, element of common sense in what we do and pragmatism. I mean, these are things which sound very simple, but they're really, really important. Mm. Um, and they're the kind of things that will get us through the next 50 years. You talked about values. Mm. To what extent do you expect those to change? I mean, a lot of people might say that even today when we talk about Asian values, Singaporean values, some people are not clear what it is. So when you talk about values, what are you referring to? Um, A whole bundle of things, but, you know, the importance of honesty, of integrity, um, of of character, of caring for other people. I mean, that's one of the nice things about Singaporeans, no matter what you say about stuff on the Internet. By and large, when there's somebody who needs help, people will come forward and contribute. Singaporeans are generally very sympathetic and empathetic in nature. And I think that that's because for the past 50 years, we've really thought in terms of of being... um, a nation and coming together to do things. So that sense of we rather than only I is, is quite important. But at the same time, this, this whole thing about individualism and it's, it's all about me is, is something which you see more and more of. So again, it's a question of striking the right balance. Make sure that you can preserve your own individual identity. But as a group, as a nation, we can move forward. Talking about uh, keeping work and play separate, 
You've huh? got this thing about play, don't you? Uh, yeah, yes. yeah. Because yeah. Keith has the, problems he doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He needs he some advice. advice. <laughs> okay. about, how do you take away, uh, do you take away uh, the problems that come to you as a member of parliament from your constituents? Can you go home and put that away? Put that aside. Yes, I, I try to. Um, I mean, when I was practicing law, I had to do that as well because there are some cases which are very emotionally draining and you cannot carry that with you all the time. Otherwise, you'll find it, you know, it's very debilitating. So um, I've learned to, to compartmentalize. But oddly enough, sometimes when I'm just thinking about stuff, uh, you'll, you'll get ideas and uh, it sort of filters in, into your work. But at least you're relaxed when you're thinking about it. You once stood up for a resident in your ward who was heckled online for wearing a T-shirt with a hole in it. And you said that the pen is mightier than the sword. And that still holds true in the internet age. We need to exercise care in what we say about others and to others. How do you think we can grow into this more compassionate society in which people are able to engage with others in this spirit? Because you said earlier that you believe most Singaporeans are empathetic, nice people. But obviously, there will be many who are not going to be that way. Uh, is there a way of making this part of our value as uh, Singapore moves into its 50 years, next 50 years? Yes, I think there is. You just really have to ask yourself, um, how is what I say or, or what I'm doing going to impact the other person? And how would I like it if I was the other person? I mean, if you just apply this simple rule, you should be able to get along all right. Thank you very much for joining us today, Ms. Indrani Raja. We were in conversation uh, this morning with Senior Minister of State for Education and Law, Indrani Raja. And of course, uh, if you have more to ask or to share with us, why don't you hit us up on our Facebook page, which is Official 938 Live. Minister of State uh, for Education and Law, Indrani Raja, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you.